What is up, everybody? How's it going? Welcome in. Welcome in to the Sacktown Sports Kings recap. Coming to you live from Golden One Center back at the G1C uh, as the Sacramento Kings unfortunately lose to the uh, New Orleans Pelicans by a score of 135-123. Uh, and, you know, this is, uh, we talked about it the other night, but this was pretty much uh, the King's last hope, or was the King's last hope at trying to secure uh, that sixth and final play playoff spot uh, with the loss today to New Orleans. This now seals the King's fate, at least in terms of uh, them playing in the play-in tournament, which is, is now their destiny. It's still not sure where they'll officially fall in the seeding. Uh, they can still fall anywhere, I believe, from seven all the way down to 10. I think there's a four-way tie or a three-way tie right now uh, in the standing. So these last two games are uh, are going to be it. These, these last two games, uh, obviously, you know, the last two games of the season are always going to be important. But with how, the, uh, with how the standings have kind of ended up shaking out, it's massive. It's going to determine it all. Uh, New Orleans pretty much secured the sixth seed. Uh, though there is a possibility that if the Kings do lose to Phoenix tomorrow, actually, uh, the Suns still do have a chance of locking down that final playoff spot. But uh, ultimately, that's that's not really the Kings' concern anymore uh, with the loss tonight, all but guaranteeing. Well, no, actually, it does guarantee, again, that, that uh, they will not be uh, guaranteed a playoff spot, which is danger territory. Uh, it's something that we've been, we've been talking about on this stream for... Uh, probably about half the season off and on as, as uh, the situation has kind of arose and, and vanished uh, from time to time. But this is probably the worst case scenario for this team. You know, they, they are now in a situation where they have to earn their way in and uh, they have to win games in order to get there. And, uh, you know, frankly, with how inconsistent they've been all year, I think that's a, that's a pretty tall task. And I don't know how many people are really going to count them in uh, into this tournament, especially considering you're playing a uh, Phoenix team that's got KD and Devin Booker. You got the Los Angeles Lakers with uh, AD and Braun. And uh, we already know the story with the Golden State folks uh, who did pick up a win tonight. Uh, squeeze one out against the Portland Trailblazers. So uh, it, it is, it's the end game now. Uh, this is, this is where you make your money. Uh, this is, this is uh, do or die time. All, all of the cliches, all, all the drama that you can throw on, it's, it's, uh, it's true. And uh, you know, now you really gotta, you really gotta hope that things go, go your way. Because tonight, um, offensively, I, I do think the Kings played well enough to win. They scored over 120 points, which has kind of been their magic number. Unfortunately, I don't even know if I want to say. I'm curious, actually, in, in the chat, do you think the Kings? defense uh, wasn't there tonight. I know obviously, you know, New Orleans scores 135 points, but I do feel like a lot of it was New Orleans just hit a lot of shots. And, you, you know, you, they, you could say that's an excuse or whatever, but CJ McCollum tonight finished 9 of 12 from 3. I know I have it down there uh, in, in the, ch in the uh, right here. I don't know what I would call this uh, in, in the stats down there, but CJ was just unconscious. I mean, 9 of 12 from 3 is absurd like you you can't uh you, you really can't compete with that honestly if, if he's going to be that hot um you got to expect him to miss some shots i do think he had one too many or two too many maybe three too many wide open looks uh but ultimately it was because new orleans had tons of options i mean trey murphy had just absolutely set them on fire he hit six threes himself uh in that third quarter uh zion really took over he was very aggressive uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what happened with Zion later today, uh, later on in the show. But um, I, I, I think the Kings did a fantastic job of making life hard on Zion in that first half. And then everything that was working, I, I'm, I'm going to have to blame Mike Brown. Like, they just threw it out the window. I, I don't understand why in that third and fourth quarter, Harrison Barnes was on Zion when the entire first half, they started off the game with Sabonis on Zion. Then Alex Len checks in. They put Len on Zion. And then when Trey Lyles was out there, they had Trey Lyles on Zion. And Zion was four of eight in that first half. And then he ends the game. Uh, what did he end it at? 13 to 21. So it just was, you know, I guess you could say he was looking for a shot a little bit more. But 
I just think that the centers worked. Like, you found something that finally worked in this matchup, and, and they just completely went away from it. Like, I, I really thought it was noticeable that Zion was having to work to get to the paint, and even then, he, he wasn't strong enough to to fight through Alex Len or Doma. So I, I didn't really understand why the entirety of that third quarter and then into that fourth quarter as well, they just stuck with, with HB on, on Zion and he, he got loose. I mean, he, he really did get loose. He had 15 points, if I'm not mistaken. He had 17. He had 17 points in the third quarter after having eight in the entire first half. So um, you let him get going. You let him get into a rhythm. Honestly, CJ and, and uh, Trey Murphy were keeping them afloat in that first half with how many threes they were hitting. And if that would have just continued, if they could have figured out how to slow down Zion in that third, I honestly think that the Kings would have had a really, really good shot at taking this. Um, that was when they, they looked their best, was in that uh, was in that third quarter. I thought that second quarter was obviously really good as well. I thought that was a great individual performance from De'Aaron in that second quarter. But, um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I, I just think that it was three different guys who took over at different points. I mean, you can even throw Alvarado in there, who I'm so sick of. I, Jose Alvarado is peak annoyance for me. I cannot stand watching that dude play. He would fit in so well on the Warriors just because he's so he's the most annoying player in the NBA. Him hitting, he hit three threes, four threes today. He was on fire. He hit, he was four of six from three tonight. And it felt like all of them were huge. I mean, he, I think he had three of them in transition. Um, one of them, he was so deep in the corner. He was pretty much behind the hoop. Um, he had a lot of wide open looks, and and you know credit to him, he knocked him down, but. For Jose Alvarado to to beat you is just it was it was it was crushing, man. It was really really crushing, um, especially to waste a, a fantastic offensive performance from HB. HB clearly uh, understood the assignment today that you know it's all hands on deck and there's no excuses at this point, and uh, you have to be aggressive. And HB, I thought after pretty much getting singled out by Mike Brown the other day in that Thunder game for not shooting. Um, Funny enough, he actually did turn down a lot of jumpers, but he just did a great job of continuing to attack the rim, going downhill, and actually getting to the rim. Uh, so shout out HB, who, you know, I, I talk about it all the time. I always come down his road and say, you know, HB's the most veteran guy on this team, and he doesn't step up. You know, how are you not going to have the guy who's been in these situations more than anyone else? He's the oldest guy who actually plays. How are you not going to step up in this team's biggest games when they have a lot of inexperience? Tonight, HB left none of that on the table. He just just really took it. I mean, I, I really was, um, I don't know if proud is the right word, but I was really just happy to see him look aggressive. And, and you know, the thing that I've been talking about all year, like have some ego, look across from you and say, this dude cannot stop me. There's no way that, you know, if I lean my shoulder to him, give him, show off a little bit of my bag that, that I can't get a good look out, a good look at the rim. And uh, he did a great job of attacking. I think he got to the line. Uh, he, uh, he only had two free throw attempts today. It felt like he, he did a great job of just getting to the cup. Uh, I know he had a couple lay-ins. He was seven of nine from two today. So I, I can't imagine HB really having uh, a better performance. He had five rebounds, four assists for HB. That's That's got to be near a season high for him in assists. Um, and, you know, it's it's just unfortunate that that performance pretty much goes wasted. Um, you know, I, I thought that Keegan definitely showed up late in that second half when they were kind of didn't really have much of a scoring punch. HB, uh, I don't think scored. He didn't score at all in that fourth quarter um, after scoring 11 in the third. So uh, it was good to see Keegan pick it up. He had nine in the fourth quarter. Uh, De'Aaron Fox had 12 in that fourth quarter. Uh, and to me, this was definitely a really big game for everybody who had questioned uh, De'Aaron Fox's. You know, I don't know if this is necessarily a super duper star performance, but definitely anybody who had questions of if De'Aaron is capable of kind of putting on his backpack and, and putting this team on his back, you saw in that second quarter. Uh, no, I'm sorry, in the at the end of the first quarter, when by the way, the start of this game is about as bad as you can get. I think the Kings, uh, they were down. Uh, they were down 33 to 11. They were down 20 in the first quarter. 
Uh, and De'Aaron Fox closed out the quarter, the first quarter, on a personal 8-0 run to bring the game within 11, hit a three to start the second quarter, and kind of gave the Kings life. Uh, the Kings started the second quarter, uh, or I'm sorry, after they went down 33-11, they then go on a 21-8 run, bring the game back to, to reaching distance. Uh, and again, I, I wrote down the Pelicans uh, really just – could not get Zion going in that second quarter with having Trey Lyles, Sabonis, and Alex Len uh, just kind of swarm him. They had nine, uh, I'm sorry, five turnovers in that second quarter. Uh, King scored nine points off of it, which was their most opportunistic quarter. Um, definitely did a great job of taking advantage of them, but uh, that second half just really wasn't good enough. I, I think uh, ultimately we're going to look back at this one and probably just be a little bit in awe at, at how CJ performed. Uh, he's been killing it since Brandon Ingram went down. I, I was looking at his numbers before the game. He's averaging just under 27 a game since Brandon Ingram's gone down. So this is kind of what he's done uh, for, for you know, really, I think B.I. went down on March 21st. Um, so it's been about three weeks or so where C.J.'s uh, put the team on his back here, and, and you see how dangerous they can be. I mean, even without Brandon Ingram, the fact that you have a dude in CJ who can easily put up 30, uh, Zion is a force that not many teams have answers for. Uh, the Kings had to get a little creative tonight by putting their centers on him. I don't think a lot of teams decide to do that, but I definitely think they found a little bit of something there. But the fact that they had CJ, uh, uh, Zion, and Trey Murphy all just put up a ton of buckets, um, that's that's why they're the sixth seed, and that's why they're probably going to remain that way. And we see, uh, we've now seen the the five and the sixth seed here in Dallas, and then in uh, in New Orleans just clearly be a level above this Kings team. So, um, you know, if if you want to get mad, if you want to yell and say, you know, this team is underachieved, looking at how these teams perform head to head, I, I don't know if they've underachieved. I really don't. It kind of feels like this is exactly in the pool where they're supposed to be. I don't know uh, if the Kings are better than Phoenix. We might find out tomorrow. They've split that season series so far. I think the Kings have looked like the better team uh, over Phoenix, and we definitely know that the Kings have been a much better team than the Lakers this year. So hopefully, uh, you know, all that will show in the in the end of season standings, and the Kings will be able to secure a seven seed and at least get uh, a playoff game, or I'm sorry, a play-in game here at Golden One Center. Um, but you know that's that's what's that's what these next couple days are going to be about, man. That's really uh, all I have to say about tonight. But um, you know, yeah, just a, another huge game tomorrow. Can't get too down on yourself uh, as as this chapter or this door closes on the playoffs. You still have to recognize that you got two more games left, and you're actually playing for something. You are seriously playing for something. You can't get too down on a loss like tonight. Um, you know, Darren always talks about how he the second he leaves this gym. Uh, he kind of lets it fall off his back. I think that's exactly what they need to do because they need to be back here in uh, in less than 24 hours and be ready to compete for their season all over again. Because if you lose tomorrow, that's where we start getting into really scary territory where this team is maybe a 9 or a 10 seed and then has to win two games. And then who knows if they're going to be a 9 or a 10 where they might have to be on the road and win both of those play-in games. So... Kings would do themselves a lot of favors by winning tomorrow, man. It's it's going to be a real, just as big of a game as today was. Tomorrow is just as big because it is it is just a an absolute monster of a schedule. It's almost like the NBA planned it this way. I know we always joke about uh, you know the NBA or, or leagues in general having scripts, but honestly, you couldn't even draw up a script this perfect where you have all these teams tied and the Kings are playing each other tomorrow. Uh, New Orleans actually tonight is going to fly over to San Francisco. They play Golden State tomorrow, so that's going to be a huge game for the Warriors and a huge game for the Kings just in this, this play-in race here. Uh, tomorrow is just absolutely massive. Tomorrow, the Kings, you know, if you want to say tonight, which I would say tonight was a game the Kings absolutely cannot lose tomorrow, um, is is equally well here we go airborne musician says tomorrow is bigger i i i will not argue with you on that um because you know it, it as the days change your situation changes and and now uh now the situation calls for the kings to fight for their play in lives uh and and try and get a home one even though i've heard a lot of people say i don't even care if it's at home because of how this team has just kind of had a lot of nights like tonight where they actually disappoint more so 
uh, on the home floor, and it feels like they have better energy on the road. Um, you know, it's, this is, these are these are the things. You know, uh, I jokingly a couple weeks ago we had Anthony Slater on the show, and uh, I was like, you know, Slater, can we please not get a 7-10 Kings Warriors playoff series? Like, I cannot handle that. And uh, Slater, being the seasoned veteran he was, kind of dismissed me and was like, "Isn't this great though? Like, this is kind of." what what sports are all about and uh you know sure you could definitely argue that it's i think that's a little bit easier to say when you've been covering a team that's won four championships uh over the past couple of years but uh i i definitely think there is a, a hint of truth to that for sure like this is this is this is the time where men are made okay uh if if the kings are going to completely collapse down the stretch here that tells us a lot about the makeup of this team and uh if they are able to persevere through malik monk being injured uh i definitely think that that shows a little something from this team a little bit of fight i think they showed some fight tonight even though today was definitely not the result that we wanted uh, I, I think that the Kings showed a great deal of fight. It was not there in the beginning of the game, but uh, better late than never. And uh, it, it came it came at the right time in that second quarter, that third quarter, even in the fourth. They got down by 20 in the fourth. And let me tell you, there was no energy, like zero energy in this building when the Kings went down 20 in the fourth quarter. Uh, Mike Brown calls a timeout, and they will go right back on a run, make this thing a game bring it within I think as close as eight uh, in that fourth quarter and then ultimately the the Pelicans just kind of pulled away um, as the Kings turned the ball over and just missed shots I think that's been the biggest I guess you could say Achilles heel of this team crazy enough is just they cannot hit open looks and you know it's a make or miss league at the end of the day and uh, you know those shots are all created equal and it just feels like when when people say the ball bounces your way, funny enough, Davion had a three that bounced his way. Um, I think those are the things that people people are referring to. It's just all these NBA guys can hit open looks. Dyson Daniels tonight can hit an open look, but you know uh, HB can be a forty percent three point shooter and have a wide open look and he can miss three of them. Uh, and for whatever reason, that's just kind of been how this Kings sto- season has gone. Shots have not fallen when they needed to fall. Uh, and, and it's been in, it's not only been in waves, it's been in like avalanches of just not being able to hit anything. So um, it's just been that kind of season for this team. And, and uh, it, it's, it's led to a lot of frustration. I think this has been uh, even like, and, and I, I promise I'm trying to not be hyperbolic here. I do seriously think, this has probably been the most frustrating King season probably since I would say DeMarcus Rondo, Gay, and George Carl season. Where again, you could argue it's probably because of expectations. That was one of the only years in the Kings drought where where there was real um, aspirations. It felt like that team maybe had a chance at at getting an eight seed, and uh, you know ultimately they fell pretty short um but i just remember that year i mean there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff with george carl and and demarcus cousins but um there was a lot of frustration with that team and just feeling like they didn't quite cap out maybe you could say the score season um i think there was a lot more fun in that score season just because uh, it was also new. It felt like the Kings were going to make the playoffs, but it was also kind of playing with house money because no one expected that team to make the playoffs. They ended up winning 39 games, but uh, ultimately didn't make the postseason. Obviously, but I, I think um, I don't. I think the frustration was more so at the end of that year. It's felt like this entire season has just been a ton of just. I mean, yeah, absolutely. From from. Uh, from the time, I, you know, I, I just kind of glanced at this comment, but from the time of, of really the summer where it was, oh, the Kings are just going to run it back. They're not going to make a big splash in free agency. That did kind of set the tone for the season in terms of uh, just disgruntlement. It feels like everybody was just waiting for something to happen. And, you know, whether it was the no trades at the trade deadline um, you know, whether it was Kevin Herter all season being up and down, whether it was Keegan not making shots. Uh, I, I, I think people got frustrated with De'Aaron for, for a good portion of time in the middle of this season. Um, it's just felt like there has not been 
really much positive to take from this year. I mean, we haven't had many game winners. There hasn't been uh, a lot of, you know, classic nights or anything like that. Uh, it just kind of feels like it's it's been um, about as bad of a season as this team could have had. And even saying that, they sit here uh, in the standings, I believe still 11 games over 500, um, which is, I, I would say, uh, a positive at the end of the day but I, I just also think that it, it points to the fact that we all feel like there's something left on the table it feels like even though um, you know you, you ran back the same team and got the same results what did you expect it still felt like there's a universe where things went better for the Kings this year uh, and they absolutely could have locked in a playoff spot definitely could have been uh, maybe a four seed, maybe a five seed. I don't know if they could have been a, a top three seed this year, but um, it definitely felt like there was enough opportunities this year if you just factor in all of those terrible losses that they've had, which we don't need to go over right now. Um, but I'll definitely tell you, if they win one of these five Pelican matchups, that's one way that the season could have gone better. Um, you know, it, it's just, it, I think it's it's a greater... Um, representation of how this season has gone which is just it's just really unfortunate that uh that it takes 80 80 games we just finished game 80 ladies and gentlemen how crazy is that um but yeah i mean just just ultimately that's it's not how uh not how you want your seasons to go let's see here let's go to the comments read you guys comments um Dude, CJ, absolutely. That's definitely the first place to start. CJ McCollum uh, absolutely murdered the Kings this year. Uh, let me see if I can get... Okay. Thank you, Will Z Stats. Appreciate this. Will Z Stats puts out CJ McCollum shot 19 of 27. That is 70% from three against the Kings this season. 70% from three that is insane that is absolutely insane nobody is supposed to do that especially not against one team that is personal i know cj had that quote of him uh you know saying oh every time i play in sacramento this is uh this is uh, i have a little bit something else for them because they skip me in the draft and i i think that's weak but uh, let me. I'm trying to pull up the sound here. I know Brendan reposted it, I believe. Yeah, let me see if we can get. So this is CJ McCollum. This feels very, very relevant to today's game here. Uh, we're gonna go Brendan Nunez. We're gonna go here, and we're gonna share this stage. So here is CJ McCollum. Uh, when was this? In January. Uh, on what happens when, uh, what, what he feels when he plays the Kings. Here's CJ. You know, there are certain gyms where you just feel better, you have a better rhythm, your shot just feels better. Is this one of those gyms and places for you? Yeah, Sacramento was supposed to draft me. They had me come back for a second workout. Um, actually told me they were going to take me at seven, and they didn't. So, so it's personal? I, I, enjoy, I enjoy playing here. <laughs> So there you go. Yeah, that uh, that was C.J. McCollum, obviously saying he uh, he takes it personal every time he plays in Sacramento because they passed him on the draft in, I think, 2014, 2013 or something like that. Uh, so C.J. apparently is still holding a grudge from that time. And uh, we get it, C.J. Message received. I think you can stop now. Uh, and that has been another trend uh, since Clay Thompson, I think, had his 30-point quarter uh, he said a very similar thing that essentially the Kings passed on him in the draft and he hasn't forgotten it. So uh, if we're going to make a list of all the people the Kings have passed on in the draft, we're going to be here all night. So, uh, you know, whatever whatever gets you ramped up for the game, CJ, good on you. But uh, you can stop now. I think we I think we got the point. Message received loud and clear. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Throwing chicken call you them chickens i did hear okay i want to hear this i did not get to hear kevin harlan's call of the chicken wing uh being thrown onto the floor let me see here if i can uh ah look at man i swear technology's scary because as i'm talking about this uh here it is right here let's hear kevin harlan's call of the chicken nugget being thrown on the floor 
Oh, I can't really hear that. Interesting. Okay, I couldn't really hear that, so I'm not going to play it, but um, apparently Kevin Harlan... It's a chicken wing. <laughs> Kevin Harlan's the goat. That's hilarious. That is hilarious. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, right as right as the game was ending, someone threw a tendy out on the floor, and uh, yeah, <laughs> why would you throw something? So I will say the chicken tenders, it's like a top. It's definitely top five meal here at Golden One Center. It's probably if I were just going for something, it's probably what I would order uh, if I were just like here for a game. I would probably go tendies and uh, get a nice little ranch with some fries. There is a sushi place upstairs uh, in, two, in between 220 and 221, which I would heavily recommend, called We Dashi. You can get actual like good sushi in the arena. I think it's only like 15 bucks too for a roll. Uh, and I'll also put you on game. There's $5 beers there as well. So uh, if you're looking for a cheap place to get a drink, Five dollar beers at Weed to She section, two twenty. Just had to put you on game. Um, Kings fans did boo. I'm curious. Uh, I mean, you know, we we've talked about Boo Gate and uh, if if, <laughs> if if uh, if fans need to boo or whatever. <clears throat> Thought it was interesting. They booed in the first quarter and I think that was it I don't think they ended up booing when the Kings went down 20 in the fourth there was just kind of shell shock um, I didn't have a problem with it <clears throat> I don't really ever have a problem with fans booing uh, especially if the team isn't playing well and it felt like especially in that first quarter when pretty much your season's on the line uh, yeah I've got no problem with that yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I did not, under I, I kind of let my feelings know and didn't understand that at all. I also didn't understand, it just felt like there was a lot of times Keon specifically, I think, fell victim to it. They were just trying to guard it. And I don't know if you're going to do well trying to guard Zion straight up. To me, it felt like you should have tried to just draw as many charges as possible. And at the very least, he's probably going to run you over uh, and, and probably throw him off balance. So I, I feel like they should have gone for charges. Uh, if you are going to, you know, help and sag off, I feel like your role should just be to stand there and try and take the charge and force him to kick it out and hit that spray three. Maybe you could argue that, you know, with how New Orleans was shooting tonight, you don't want to leave CJ, you don't want to leave Trey, you don't want to leave Jose uh, wide open for three. Definitely don't want to leave Herb Jones open for three. So um, that's kind of the catch-22 of playing New Orleans, and that's why Zion just needs to be surrounded by shooters because he's going to drive, he's going to penetrate, he's going to suck in the defense, and then everybody's going to be wide open for three, and that's what you saw. It was Trey Murphy at first, then it was CJ, uh, and then it was Jose, and then it was CJ again. And, uh, you know, that's that's why they're so tough to play. And that's without another shooter and just straight-up bucket in Brandon Ingram. So that's a really, really tough team with a ton of talent. Um, and even then, they were close. The Kings were really, really close at the end of this. Um, Domas definitely looked like he was having a hard time with Valanciunas. Uh, Valanciunas is uh, somebody who's incredibly familiar with Sabonis' game. They play together in uh, Lithuania, the Lithuanian national team. So uh, they practice against each other. They've probably known each other for close to their entire lives. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that Valanciunas kind of knows Sabonis' game like the back of his hand. And uh, he is also just like the, the frame of somebody who would give Sabonis problems. So really wasn't too surprised by that. But even then, so the fact that Sabonis, I think, finished with 16 and 10, um, you know, definitely wasn't great. But uh, that's, that's a good performance out of him. That's not um, something that I think, you know, you ultimately – I think you, you definitely want more out of Sabonis. But if he gets 16 and 10 – um, I think that's fine. 
Yeesh. I'm probably going to do three stars here and head out. Uh, as there's another stream tomorrow that i uh, got to get ready for. Um, yeah, I noticed Trey wasn't playing in the fourth. I don't know um, what necessarily that, that was about. Um, he wasn't super locked in from three, uh, but he did hit a couple, and they were wide open in transition. Uh, got his feet, stepped into it, and uh, he, he knocked down a couple of them. So it was a little bit surprising, but I think they just opted for HB and Keegan. And, um, you know, HB had the hot hand up until the fourth quarter, and Keegan definitely was knocking down shots in the fourth. So ultimately, I, it's probably because those two uh, were playing so well, and, you know, I thought it was interesting that Sasha kind of checked in um, at one point in there too. And, uh, you know, he, he had an okay game. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was terrible. Um, I think I've been on record by saying uh, this is Keegan's biggest need of development is, is attacking. He has no finishing moves at all. He, uh, he can dunk. That's about it. Uh, if he's not attacking the rim in that sense, if he's not going for the dunk, really doesn't have much of any touch uh, around the rim does not have body control, um, doesn't have touch around the rim again. Uh, it doesn't have moves. Like, he doesn't have a Euro step. He doesn't uh, have an up and under move that he goes to. He doesn't have a floater that he really goes to. So um, that's definitely the part of Keegan's game that needs the most developing by far. I know he needs to improve his ball handling. I know he needs to improve uh, his, his passing ability. But uh, to me, his finishing is, is terrible. I mean, I, I posted a video on Twitter. It's my favorite clip of the season. Uh, when the Kings got absolutely destroyed by the Sixers on that one uh, ESPN Friday night where Joel Embiid didn't play. At the beginning of that broadcast, I can't remember who the, the sideline reporter was, but they uh, said, you know, De'Aaron Fox had a conversation with Keegan Murray and said, you're the last season you were the worst finisher in the league. This year, it's my challenge to you to get better. And, you know, I definitely think he's better than last year, but uh, I definitely think that Keegan is probably in like the uh, the the lower percentile of finishers uh, in this league, just in terms of like ability to create at the rim. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, they really miss Herder and uh, and Malik tonight for sure. I mean, Malik's just got that scoring ability, that scoring punch. Also, somebody called into the show the other day and really had a great point of, of talking about how, you know, he create, uh, Malik creates so many scoring opportunities for Sabonis in that pick and roll as well. Like, um, you know, you kind of, when Malik's in that pick and roll, it kind of forces the big to either help off on Malik uh, to stop him from getting to the rim or he's going to guard Sabonis and uh, Malik's going to have the option of finishing at the rim, taking his floater. Um, or, you know, if, if it's there, hitting that pocket pass to Sabonis, and they just don't have that um, they don't have that in their repertoire anymore without Malik out there. There's not really anybody to run, pick, and roll with. And so you just kind of see, like, that's like six points that Sabonis normally gets that he's just not getting anymore. Uh, yeah, three stars of the game here. We're, we're going to move on um and do our three stars let me get the box score as i drop that uh huh i'm gonna give my first star to keegan am i gonna give it to keegan i think i'm gonna give it to keegan um would consider giving it to davion for sure um you know what no i think i'm gonna give it to davion i'm gonna give it to davion keegan didn't really um have that impactful of a game I felt like uh, the fourth quarter was obviously great. He had not. He had nine points in the fourth. I think he hit. Did he hit three threes in the. He did, all threes. So he hit three threes in that fourth quarter, um, which definitely helped uh, his scoring total. But ultimately, I just didn't think he had a big enough imprint on this game. Um, defensively, didn't really notice him at all. Uh, offensively, besides those threes, not really many moments that I can specifically remember uh, for Keegan. In that game, and so yeah, I'm gonna give my uh, I'm gonna give my one star to Davion Mitchell, who played a lot uh, in that first half. It felt like he played I think like eight or nine minutes in that second quarter, um, which isn't usually typical for him. Uh, he he is just 
you know, he's he's like the Tasmanian devil. He is he is really just in people's grill. And uh, you know, when he's guarding CJ, I, I definitely think uh, CJ doesn't like to have him on the ball. I definitely feel like uh, Davion is is very comfortable with who he is at this point in his career. He knows what kind of shots he can get to now. You see him attacking the rim. You see him uh, taking that step back mid-range jump shot. And of course, you know he wasn't really super active from three tonight. I don't even know if he took a th he. It was two of two from three. It must have happened early. Uh, how, both of them happened in the second quarter. I really don't remember those threes from Davion. Uh, they shut off the jumbotron, um, but yeah, definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely felt like uh, Davion had had a pretty big impact on tonight's game. So I'm gonna give him one star, two stars. I'm gonna give to HB. I uh, ultimately wanted to give three stars to HB. Um, yes, and absolutely kudos to HB. Pelicans just couldn't miss. Just handed it to them. Uh, definitely kudos to HB for sure for stepping up. Um, I give HB probably a harder time than anybody besides JaVale on this team, and uh, he stepped up really big. This was a massive, massive game for this team. Uh, with Zion being their their best player with Brandon Ingram out, um, which he probably is their best player even with Brandon Ingram in there, but um, with BI out, it's clear that this team is going to go uh, as far as Zion takes them. And I thought HB at the very least on the offensive end was willing to step up to that challenge because uh, you know you're probably going to hold you're probably not going to hold Zion to under 20 points. And so uh, for HB to at the very least try and neutralize that matchup even a little bit or at least do his part in chipping in on it, I uh, definitely felt like um, he was really aggressive. And like I said, just felt I think understood the assignment was definitely uh, the right phrasing for how HB played tonight because it just felt like he was not going to be denied. He knew what he wanted to get to, uh, did a great job of getting some of those back cuts and, and just kind of falling behind the defense and getting some easy lay-ins and you saw Sasha take advantage of that a couple times as well. Um, I just thought it was a great overall offensive game for, out of HB. Defensively, again, we kind of talked about it, but ultimately I don't think anybody really played fantastic defense uh, when they score 135. Oh, I thought you were talking about me, Manny. I was like, I did not feel like I was glazing Keegan at all. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. I was like, damn. Uh, and that leaves uh, three stars for uh, the King star, De'Aaron Fox, uh, who, again, I really didn't think I was going to end up giving three stars to him, but the way he closed out that game, uh, the way that he performed in that first quarter when things were really getting out of hand, felt like he kind of took the initiative to say, look, I cannot let my team just completely drown right now. Uh, that 8-0 that run that he went on to end the first, he hit a three to start the second, uh, really gave this team life where they were on life support. Uh, and that's exactly what you want your best player doing. And, uh, you know, Darren stepped up to the to the call. I, I definitely think this is a a, a check in the book of, of De'Aaron Fox uh, being being a, a possible, you know, at, at for the very least for this team, being a number one guy. I, I do think that a lot of people were starting to question how good of a player is Deere. And like he, he you know, after taking what was it, 17 threes the other night against OKC, I definitely think people were questioning uh, how badly he wanted it, how much he was settling for jumpers. Is he falling in love too much with the three? Tonight um, felt like a much better balance. He ended up taking seven threes, which is the number I think I said yesterday is like the max that he should be taking. Uh, you know, it didn't really feel like the shot ultimately was was falling, not nearly as much as it was the other night. Um, but he still he still keeps true to it, man. And I think um, that's just going to be the guy that we're going to have to live with moving forward. Clearly, the three point shot is something uh, he believes in and he thinks is is a necessary part of uh, expanding his game. So uh, just just kind of you know, nice to see De'Aaron. I think he recognized that 17 was probably too many, and he takes 10 less uh, tonight and did a great job of attacking the rim. That was the biggest thing when he was being aggressive early. Um, you saw him get to his floater. You saw him get to the uh, like actually get to the rim uh, like three or four times tonight. He had a big dunk in transition, had a couple uh, moments in transition tonight. That is De'Aaron Fox that we want to see. That is the De'Aaron Fox that this team needs. Uh, if they are going to make it through a play-in, which is the situation they find themselves in now. So uh, got to get used to, to talking about this. This is 
Somehow, in the long storied history of this franchise, some would say that this is the oldest franchise in the NBA, um, as they celebrate their 100 year anniversary this year, even though some people are saying that this is actually their 101st season, but that's a story for a different time, uh, as they celebrate that milestone. This is the first time in franchise history that the Kings have been in the play-in tournament. Uh, obviously, it's new or newer. Uh, it's I think it's been around for f four years, maybe five, may maybe a little bit longer. But um, this is the first time that the Kings have actually fallen into the play-in tournament. So that'll be new. It'll be new for us all. I'm not quite sure how we're going to navigate those waters. I imagine those games feel like playoff games, but... Um, without the ultimate reward of, of a playoff game, uh, all the stress and not much of, of the payoff. So uh, I guess I'm looking forward to, to that, to that new experience. So uh, hopefully hopefully we, we first off can survive uh, these last two games because the Kings still do have a big opponent tomorrow. And uh, if they lose to the Blazers on Sunday... I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll tell you this. I'm not, I, I might not be on this stream, <laughs> okay? Because uh, that, that, uh, that would not be good. Uh, that would not be good. So we'll, we'll see how the rest of the season goes. Uh, I will be right back on tomorrow after the game against Phoenix. Hopefully we're talking about how the Kings bounced back, took advantage uh, of Phoenix, and, and didn't get too down on themselves and stayed focused at the task at hand. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we can talk about that tomorrow. Y'all have a fantastic night. Unfortunately, the beam is not lit, so I'm going to go walk out to a warm, uh, beamless, dark night out there in Sacramento. Y'all have a fantastic night, and I will see you tomorrow.